Canvas, on the other hand, does have support for 2D and 3D images. All the latest browsers now support Canvas. Now, all the latest browsers, meaning IE9. I can't make that same promise for IE9 on the smartphone, but uh, on all the other uh, user agents out there, we do have support for Canvas in 2D mode. If you want to check out the 3D mode, a few browsers also now have support for that that we just didn't have even a few months ago. The 3D mode is using WebGL, which is taking advantage of your graphics card that's built into your machine. And with that graphics card, it, it uh, can do some stunning graphics in 3D. A great place to check it out is playground.html5rocks.com. Let's see if we can go there now. Let's go check it out real quick. We're, we're almost done here with this deck, and I decided to check this out. So I'm going to go ahead and select it, copy it, and we'll go to Aurora, which is like cutting edge with Mozilla Firefox. And I'm in your HTML5 rock site, but playground at HTML5 can show me some of the different things I can play around with in HTML5. And let's see if we've got a canvas object. Here we go. Here's 3D. And if I can scroll down here. Yes. So you see this box here. And what they want you to do, I know it's absolutely huge here. i got to get zoomed in. But I can use the left and right arrow keys to rotate this. See it's spinning here. Hopefully you guys are able to see this. But I can also use the up and down arrow keys to spin it this way as well. So this is using the 3D version of Canvas to do this. If you take a look at the code here, you can see how it's uh, getting context for experimental WebGL. And then this is the create texture. Go ahead and create the textures and the speed rotation. And uh, there's some great example code. You can take a look at this. You can see how I'm handling. It's handling the events for the key down and the key up. And I can't get that thing to stop spinning, right? So we get a pretty cool example using the 3D version of this. So that's the 3D version, but that's barely supported by any of the browsers. That's just cutting-edge stuff. Most people are used to the 2D version. This is what most of the browsers support now, where you get some basic uh, drag-and-drop functionality, right? Uh, and this is just one example. It's really easy to do canvas drawing. And let me show you an example of that here in my slide deck. Keep in mind that the canvas object is allows you to go ahead and define a drawing path. It will actually form an invocation list for the, for the actual drawing or filling. And then when you actually tell it to go ahead and draw, it will do all the drawing, and then it will forget everything it's done. So there is no memory of where it drew what. That's going to be up to you writing your JavaScript to store that information. Like, for example, if you're writing a video game or something and you want to do collision detection, you have to know where you drew all the little characters or whatever it is that's on the screen to check for that collision detection. You're going to have to track that in memory because whatever it draws, it flushes. The canvas tag is literally like the SVG. It's just its own little tag. You give it an ID and set its width and height. And you can put text in here to go ahead and warn the user in case the browser doesn't support it, and maybe you haven't included a, a polyfill that can cover their browser. This is some JavaScript that is called drop pick, and maybe you could call this, you know, put a button on the form and just run this JavaScript when they click the button. You can see the very first thing we're doing here is getting element by ID, my canvas. So wherever the canvas object happens to be, we got a handle to it with this little variable. Before you actually do this drawing, it's kind of a mystery where it actually exists. That's why a lot of times people who work with Canvas, and especially during the development process, will actually use the little CSS style just to put a border around it so they know where it's going to be on the page. That's just a little hint. Maybe draw a little red dash and border, and then you'll see it right away. And then we have to get context 2D. Remember, it's not just 3D for the 3D version. We have to say WebGL. And uh, with this one, we get 2D, and we're checking to see if it's even possible, because if it is possible, Great, we'll get context, and then we start beginning path. By calling begin path, it's starting to form its invocation list of what it's going to do. So I initially move to 100 by 100, and I'm telling it I want it to line to 200 by 200, line to 100 by 200, and then I call close path, which basically means wherever you currently are, draw a line all the way back to where you started. Stroke actually draws the actual work. So it says, okay, I got this huge invocation list. Stroke goes and does it. And it flushes the memory. It flushes the actual path, if you will, of what needs to be done. And so I got this neat little triangle here with this. Now, mind you, there are film methods available. You can draw these uh, Bezier curves. 
you can do quadratic curves, you can draw circles, you can do fill, you can do um, images. You can put an image on a canvas object, multiple images if you'd like. You can also do sprites for animation. Maybe you have a character walking and you have like 12 different sprites for that. You could actually go ahead and change up between the sprites with your JavaScript code. Test, test, test. So that's just a little touch to the canvas. There is a great O'Reilly book, by the way, on the canvas. They got a little tiny one that's a, a canvas reference book. That's kind of cool. But they've also got a big, thick one that, uh, believe it or not, has a lot of tips for getting you started on writing your own little video game, which I thought was pretty interesting. So the resources. I've got a resource list of here what I recommend. Um, of course, hey, we have an HTML5 class that I wrote. I mean, you just saw bits and pieces of it here. I go into much greater detail with the Canvas and SVG that I did here. Uh, you saw how I went into some detail about the new tags and stuff. That's more like what the class is going to be involved in. But it also has detailed labs, so if you prefer to learn by doing, that's exactly what you'll do. We do have classes scheduled for May 24th and 25th, and as well as July 23rd and 24th. I've got it slated as a two-day class with eight chapters total. I've got a chapter on mobile development as well. The interesting thing about mobile development is that Eventually, I suspect that's going to be a lost art form. Eventually, people are going to want, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. On my mobile phone, I prefer to view pages regular rather than seeing mobile versions. And I suspect the browsers will get better and better on our mobile phones that uh, we prefer to always see regular versions of sites rather than mobile versions. So it's just, it's an interesting topic for discussion. But I've got a chapter on that, and I've got, like I said, I've got eight different chapters on HTML5 and CSS3. CSS3 is its own full chapter. We go into much more than just a simple little gradient example. So um, if there's a huge demand for that, we'll even add more dates for that. But those are the two that we have right now. These are some books I recommend, guys. Uh, my favorite is the Brown book. Make sure you get the second edition, Introducing HTML5, who actually has uh, content, and it was written by people from Opera. It's got a warped sense of humor. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I love it. I think it's hilarious, but it's also extremely informative. It shows some of the history of where they came from and the good and bad things based on 5 development. Some of the other good ones, of course, there is a mobile application development in 24 hours book, and then one right below it, HTML5 and CSS3 for the real world is an excellent book with a ton of details for CSS3. The bottom one's a good one, too. Visual Quick Start Guide CSS3 is red and white. And it's got a lot of examples with Alice in Wonderland, but it's got some great stuff in CSS in there. And a little bit of HTML5. Be careful when you buy an HTML5 book, folks. Look, take a look at the copyright. If the copyright is 2010, the book is junk. It's perfect for holding up a table leg. That's about it. Because these standards have been changing, right? These books I've got up on the screen here are 2011 latest or 2012. Prefer to get the newest books possible. Like, I'm pointing out a second edition for introducing HTML5, that brown book. His first edition, though, is already, it's been approved upon by second edition with new changes. Links, I've got a ton of links. Here's a few of the links I can recommend. Browserscope.org can actually show you some of the decent uh, browser testing. CSS3 test actually performs a test on your browser as you load the page. That's pretty cool. You actually see it computing and telling you how much your, your current browser is supporting. There's a modernizer list of cross-browser polyfills. We've also got uh, HTML5 Rocks, Interoperability, HTML5 Labs is actually Microsoft's website. See the HTML5 Labs? That site tells you how they're coming along with upgrading IE with IE10 and what they're adding into the next version of the browser for new support. This basically wraps up our presentation. We Oh, Intertech training, we do virtual and instructor-led. If you wanted to take the class virtually, we could set you up. We'll give you a machine to work on virtually as well through the cloud. And, of course, uh, these are some of our Intertech resources. Well, thanks, everybody. That's what I've got for this presentation. I hope this has been useful. I hope I didn't waste anybody's time. This is uh, something to introduce you to the HTML5 concepts. And it's a moving target. If I just had a list of this browser supports this one and this doesn't, all my answers could change by tomorrow. Thank you.